Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of That Early Childhood Nerd. I'm Heather Burnt Santi. Very, very, very excited uh, to have uh, Stephanie Galloway joining me today. Hi, Stephanie. Hey, Heather. Hi. Before I let you tell people about yourself, I just have to say how much I um, enjoyed getting to know you at NACI and like those rocking chair conversations. What a great idea for NACI to have all those rocking chairs out in the in the in the hallways and, and spaces, because I feel like we got to know each other so well, just sitting there rocking and talking about resilience. <laughs> it could have been a front porch for all we knew. Right? Yeah. So I'm just really glad to, to be looking at you again and be talking with you. Um, so what do you want people to know about you before we jump into our conversation? Um, well, I, I am a lifer in the early childhood field. Um, I have started, had my first uh, child care center on my back porch when I was nine years old. <laughs> One of those kids who wanted to be a teacher from the time they were like in preschool themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, in spite of that clear definition of what it was that I wanted to do when I grew up, um, I did a lot of circles and spirals around uh, what I wanted not to do. Um, I certainly have spent a long, long time in, um, in child care in preschools. I was a director, early intervention. I taught elementary school. Um, I worked with adjudicated teens. Um, I've done uh, that. Wow. Library. <laughs> um, I was a children's librarian or an assistant because I didn't have the right d- mm-hmm. degree. A storyteller um, and ended up uh, teaching community college for over 20 years in oh, two different gosh. community colleges in, in Pennsylvania. And I guess I say all that because um, mostly what I believe in is development. Mm -hmm. And I followed my strong curiosity and wonder about development and wherever it led me, that's where I wanted to be at that moment. So I, um, it kind of took me in a lot of really interesting places. Um, and the other thing that's been kind of a constant in my life is my love of fairy tales mm-hmm. and the imagination. And yeah. so that's how I got to where I am right now. Yeah. Great segue because you're here. <laughs> it's like you had this plan. Um, so you wrote a book that's called <laughs> Happily Ever Resilient, Using Fairy Tales to Nurture Children Through Adversity. And that's what we're going to talk about. But um, I mean, I, I think this is when I say we, we we had those rocking chair conversations about resilience, I think you had heard me express frustration with the way resilience is being thrown around. And, yes. and, and so that was a starting point for us. So, um, so just to clarify, I think, you know, I've, I've loved reading this book. It's wonderful. I, I can't wait for people to hear you and, um, and to get the book, but my my frustration is not about the idea that we need to build resilience or help children foster that. It's that people just see it as, oh, they are resilient. They already are resilient. So it doesn't matter what we throw at them. They're going to be fine. And, you know, we heard it a lot at the end of, well, the end of the, the major part of, of COVID. We're not quite at the end, um, but where where people didn't really want to talk about what children needed because yes. they're resilient. Um yes. And, and so I think this is really important, this conversation to have now. I, I, I agree. I think um, when I, the more I think about resilience and I certainly am, we'll talk about it a lot more, but your, your, your comment did, I mean, I was, I remember the exact moment I was driving back. <laughs> oh. So I can't listen to early childhood podcasts in my car. I can't do it. <laughs> um, I was safe. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> But I think that uh, I've, it, it's really good to hear different opinions. And I've been gathering like the people who have said, I, I'm not sure about resilience for many, for other reasons as well. Oh, And I think that, I mean, it's kind of all clumped into this, it's a big generalization type of word and yeah. it's used by everybody. Um, but I've started to think about it. Like, I mean, we don't say children young children, I mean, we do say that they talk, but we say there's a developmental process behind that, right? There's a developmental process behind everything that all of us do. And I think that's, that's what I really believe we need to start thinking about with resilience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I think it's kind of like, if we said, well, children can be healthy. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, they can. Um, There's things we do that contribute negatively, negatively or positively or, or, or sort of, you know, but 
Um, it's not just something that they spring into life fully, fully having, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I think, or that I think, it can't be changed by its circ by the circumstances. Absolutely. I mean, I think in taking it from a neurodevelopmental point of view, which is what current researchers are doing, mm -hmm. really takes it off of the, the um, plate of everybody had like only, only really like special people have it or everybody yeah. has. It. It's yeah. actually, it's like, sure. The vast majority of people do learn how to talk. But there's yeah. a really wide continuum depending on many, many different factors right. on how how you talk, how fluently you mm -hmm. talk, mm -hmm. vocabulary you use, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that that's that's an important I, I believe that that's what's important to really start wrestling with with the term resilience as well. Yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and read the quote because I have to. It's it's in, you know, it's okay. in the rules. Um, this is just from very early in your book, page two, but you wrote. We can transform our best practices surrounding play stories and nurturing relationships into the protective factors for resilience, which are attachment, initiative, self-regulation, and cultural affirmation. So I want to let you talk just a little bit about that. And then I want you to talk about the book as a whole and like what it, how you, what you do with it and how it contributes okay. to resilience. Okay. Um, so um, I, to the 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 quote that you read is was my big aha moment. Um, I came to study resilience because I went back at age fifty nine to get my doctorate, and um, don't was tell me very... that. <laughs> I just at fifty three decided I don't need it. Okay, I know. Anyway. Well, I had to. <laughs> yeah, um, go ahead. But then, honestly, um, what happened was um, I um, my husband passed away from substance mm -hmm. use disorders, and I'd mm -hmm. learned a lot about the impact of substance use disorders on um, on me as an adult, yeah. and who was like didn't didn't it was a family disease. I and after he passed, and and on kids, mm -hmm. and I realized I never had any professional development about it, and so I went back to get my doctorate because I did not have the self discipline to learn what I wanted to learn about what teachers really might find useful in oh, working. Wow substance use disorder. So that was my like spiral. Okay. I did not plan. I mean, I always thought, yeah, I'll get my doctorate, but I never, I mean, you know, like after 50, I was like, yeah, well, yeah. Um, but, but I had a real burning um, interest in trying to figure out what it was that would, it, was there anything that teachers could be doing or that mm -hmm. could do with children that would support them who, um, if they were living with, with parents um, with substance use disorders. Mm -hmm. So that was my like, how it got there. Yeah. And in the process of my research and all the coursework and everything, I, I hit upon resilience and I was like, I thought, Oh, this is good. This is positive. It's not yeah. just everything. So sad, all the research mm -hmm. on trauma and substance use disorders and all that. So here is like, Oh, I like this. this yeah. Is, <laughs> this is a <laughs> and the more I dug into resilience and specific uh, models of resilience and the research on resilience, um, um, one, it is a primary protective factor to help people who have been exposed to ACEs, su including substance use disorder, to not, for substance use, dis use disorders, there's a there's a genetic, a pretty strong genetic component. Mm -hmm. uh, they found that re this um, resilience was actually um, a, like a neurodevelopmental way that could be, could offset the trajectory and had positive um outcomes once somebody got older. So that was mm -hmm. all very positive and mm -hmm. good. Yeah. Um, but then I really dug into it and I was like, oh, these protective factors play. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like all the we all of the good things that we know about child development mm -hmm. are what you need to develop this resilience. Okay. And we know that as much as we understand about how um how important play and choice and uh, like wonderful loose parts all mm -hmm. of the discovery and nature and all of the good things are it's not happening mm -hmm. as much as we want right and i've been in the field for like you know over 50 years and i mean i've never had a calendar time with a preschooler it's because in the 1970s we knew that that was stupid and so <laughs> what 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 is it that we are have have missed and i mm -hmm. thought okay 
maybe there's a way that um, if what we we know about child development is what Ann Manson called the ordinary magic of resilience. I mean, she said there's nothing, there's nothing, nothing exceptional. There's no special program that you have to put into place. There's it's just these relationships and attachment. It's it's giving kids and it, letting them be have initiative and agency. Mm-hmm. It's discovery. It's all uh, executive function, self-regulation and and cultural affirmation. The things that are part, like they are pretty much the pillars of developmentally appropriate practice. Mm -hmm. Maybe this is a different frame to offer people to rethink their practices. Yeah. That, and and it becomes a both and instead of an either or um, social, emotional, or early academics. It's like resilience to me is the, the biggest umbrella that we, Honestly, for me, it, it it encompasses everything, but it's also there. I really don't think that there's anything more important than preparing us to face challenges in life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I think there's always stuff to learn, right? You, um, I'm, I'm not here, obviously, as that early childhood nerd to say, y'all don't have to learn anything anymore because just play hap- play makes it all happen and it's magic. Um but it it i do think that that's a barrier with some some conversations about resilience because you know a, a teacher in an early childhood classroom or someone who's doing child care at home in their home and they they hear this idea about protective factors and resilience and they think they need some sort of certification to start you know to to start understanding it but what i what I hear, heard you talking about there and what I what I got a lot from a lot of this in the book is we can learn as we go, but we can still start. Like there's a starting point now. If we we don't have to feel like we can't work with children's trauma until we're perfect and we've achieved this <clears throat> standard of, of certification or something like that. Right. And I, I think, I mean, I actually, I got into it quite a bit with um, colleagues of mine um, when I started to get into this work, because they're um, like, pe- especially the people who were in social work, they were uh-huh. like, like, excuse me, trauma <laughs> and substance use disorders are our field. Right. And, and I was like, yeah, but you know what, early childhood people are with these children, eight to 10 to 12 hours a day. Mm-hmm. And y- y- you, you, you don't have time, like, right. like, <laughs> you don't have time to do all right. this. And that's what I think um, Dr. Mastin's work on um, resilience to me was so affirming because everybody needs resilience. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I look back at my childhood and I had all of the protective factors of resilience and I had a very non-traumatic childhood, mm-hmm. um, but I've had a, an extremely traumatic adulthood and it's because of that core of resilience, mm-hmm. because uh, that I, I, I've been able to bounce back. And instead of being curled up in a little ball someplace, um, I'm, I'm, you know, I wrote a book. I went to mm-hmm. back for my doctorate. I read a book. Mm-hmm. I'm like, yeah. I, I'm still curious. I love to learn and keep keep growing. So I really think that um, to me, that was the other big thing that I hope to accomplish through my research, through getting this the word out there, is that um creating an environment to develop resilience is not just for kids who have experienced trauma mm-hmm. and for one thing we often don't know who these kids are right know, you know like you know you might know some of them but mm, and mm-hmm. chances yeah. are one in four kids lives in a home impacted by substance use disorders i mean mm-hmm. that's that's a lot yep. and you don't necessarily know those kids but you also all kids even if they are in an, an ideal situation and have no trauma or no big challenges right now um they need to develop resilience because mm-hmm. that's what the brain is going to need as they adapt to every right. all the changes right it's like um you know, they're like, what was I just going to say when, when I talk about inclusion or, or practices around belonging, it benefits everybody in the space. It's not just for that person, that child, that person, whoever, who, you know, is disabled mm-hmm. or whatever. And I yeah. think about this the same way whenever, and, and I, that's why I like that some people are shifting their language from trauma responsive to trauma informed, because mm-hmm. we don't have to wait to see it to respond. We can learn about these resiliency uh, protective factors and resilience and just do it for everybody. Yes. 
And that, yeah. that 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 to me is, I mean, the more I learned about the all of the neuroscience behind it and what it actually involved and connected it with all the mm -hmm. dots of everything I knew about child development, mm -hmm. it was okay. So it, it this is this is a an umbrella that all teachers should be using in their classrooms. Yeah. Um, for all kids and how do you be and it also incorporates um, much of what we're already doing and I think mm -hmm. to me it's, it's not so much doing things that are very different for for many many of us right. it's just kind of like turning the kaleidoscope a little bit so that your lens is focused on okay yes I'm hugging this child because mm -hmm. that's what I do yeah I'm also nurturing their resilience because they need this attachment. They need this connection. And that's part of resilience too. Yeah. 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 I remember when I was working with, um, it was school age and teenagers who um, had a lot of trauma in their life. It was just a, we were just a drop in community center. They'd come play basketball and, and hang out with our, our adult staff and stuff. Um, and I, I would have dreams that there would be babies crying that I couldn't find. And I called my friend, Jenny, who's my dream person finally. And I was like, what is happening? And she said, I can't believe you don't just know this. There are needs around you every day that are big that you feel like you can't meet. And, and she did, she broke it down. She's like, but the relationships that you form and just being that safe space, like you can't maybe fix all of those big things, but you're making a difference in all of those consistent everyday um you know, play and relationships and all that wow. kind of stuff. And so I thought about that too, while I was reading this, that a lot of times too, it feels so daunting. Mm -hmm. We can't solve all these problems. Right. And I, I mean, I, I certainly um, like back when I was working with, with teenagers and, and other, and even younger children mm -hmm. and kids, all kids, there've always been those kids that I couldn't quite figure out, mm -hmm. couldn't, you know, and, and, Looking back, I'm thinking, gosh, if you'd known that, um, um, if you'd know knew that the uh, there was a you know that this child had had trauma. I've had kids who I worked with in elementary school. I've you know become friends with on Facebook, uh -huh. it's 20s and 30s, and they're yeah. like, yeah, I don't know if you knew this, but you know, like this was going on in my home when I was mm -hmm. in your class. And I'm like, oh my god, if had yeah. I known, and they said, no, it doesn't matter mm -hmm. that you or not. It's that relationship. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, you offered, you, you opened your heart. You were that person who I knew was always going to be there, that you were always going to tell the stories and play and yeah. have fun with me. And, and it was a safe space. And yeah. so I, I think we've got to recognize that we're not, if we, if you're, you're not going to necessarily be that, the person that's going to save that child's life, but mm -hmm. Yeah. You can do a lot of things that help all kids. So um, you've got, there were three things in the quote um, you talked about play stories and nurturing relationships. And I'm going to, I'm going to go mix them up a little bit. We kind of talked about play. We're digging into relationships now, but what, what kinds of things, how do I want to ask this? So whenever I talk to groups of people, whether it's doing a workshop or, or teaching at the college, when I talk about relationship building and attachment, it's really difficult to move them past. Well, they all love me. They all are happy. You know, they all, they give me hugs, we're, you know, whatever, but, but we're talking about something a little bit more intentional, like that's great, but, but how do you, how do you describe the intentional relationship building that we, that would impact these protective factors? Um, I mean, that's a great question. And that's, <laughs> yeah, you know, I don't know. I, I, I mean, honestly, it, what, for one thing, I think it, it may look a little bit different for different people, mm -hmm. um, different caregivers will have sure. different ways of that. But to me, it's about listening to the mm -hmm. kids and respecting them. I mean, you know, like I, I respected every child, every teen I ever worked with as an individual. I tried to get to know them, listen to them, hear their stories, um, not push things when not push my own agenda onto them. Because to me, that reciprocity is something that is sometimes, um, with, with, I mean, for really little kids, I mean, they don't, they don't talk back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so it, yeah. There's that stream going out from you. Uh -huh. um, and to me, it's that, that, um, reciprocal relationships are really what it's all about. Yeah. And it doesn't mean I give you love, you give me love. It's like, I, I ask a question and I listen to what you say. Yeah. And then and we figure out what we're going to do about discovering what we're, how we're going to play or yeah. what that worm is doing on, the, on 
Aww. Yeah, I or think it. Is. <laughs> yeah, it goes back to play because when children are playing, it's like we're sort of listening to them when they can't verbally tell us about themselves yet. They're they're telling us a lot through their play that we can use to connect, even if their play isn't necessarily telling you home is really messy right now. Um, and I want to throw in here too that home's not the only place these children experience trauma. Sometimes it's in our programs and sometimes it's in school. Yeah. Um, they may not be able to say that or or play in a way that explicitly shows you that, but there's something you can see in their play to use to connect mm -hmm. with them. I, I, I found um, the, like, the, it, and if you listen, they, they'll tell you. I, yeah. I worked with a little boy in, when I was teaching first grade who is probably the, the most obvious child I've ever worked with who had experienced trauma mm -hmm. uh, he was in a foster home. He did things like put rubber bands around his neck. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, very, very interesting child. And I, I just, you know, I always had books out. I had stuff out and he grabbed um, Rapunzel one day mm -hmm. and he goes, read me this book. And I was like, six-year-old boy Rapunzel. And it right. was like Luffy, like Paul Zielinski's beautiful mm -hmm. Castle one and and so I read it to him and he was like uh I want to I want to I want I want to make me a braid and I was like okay well like let's look around what could you find that you could make a braid out of uh -huh. and, and the paper and the scissors and he made it and he taped it on the back of his head wow his braid and went through the and he was now I want to make that tower <laughs> and like I, we recreated our whole, and I brought out everybody. I mean, the kids knew he was a little different. Mm -hmm. um, we brought the entire group in, and I was like, hey, Albert wants to make a tower. Anybody got any ideas? And we did this thing, mm -hmm. and I was first grade, so I was yeah. like, tower. Yeah. <laughs> Throw in all those things that make it acceptable to <laughs> the outsiders. And I was like, this is actually phonics. It looks like, <laughs> it looks like we're creating like a huge tower on our, our wall. But I know it looks like joy is happening, but don't worry. <laughs> don't worry. We're, we got, we got that little stuff in there, but this, I mean, it was transformational wow. and the, the child um, like came out, he quit, like took the rubber bands. Uh, like it took, I mean, it took yeah. weeks, but all the kids were fascinated they all he was the, he became the leader i mean mm -hmm. this whole wonderful like like the things that we all like we love to see happen yeah. with groups of children all came out of it but it was because i had kept my mouth shut and listened and recognized that you know this he he wanted this random story read mm -hmm. that like it yeah. didn't make sense to me, yeah. um, but I respected it. And I respected that he could take his own initiative and he can, and all of those protective factors for resilience mm -hmm. uh, and including that cultural affirmation, because I think that's something we often forget mm -hmm. is we're not talking about kids culture with a capital C. We're talking about what the culture is within our classroom mm -hmm. and how we build those connections and feeling like, I mean, they were all like, I, I, some of the kids that I've spoken with who were in that class, like actually remembered building that tower. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah. Like and years later. you know, with the, with the best of intentions at one point in, you know, in my career, I could see this happening. I would have brought in books that had foster families or things like that and, and include that, you know, have that representation, but by letting him choose the book, it was much more, like powerful. Like I think about the hubris of me as an early teacher thinking that I could guess what was going to be relevant and meaningful and connect for children instead of letting them tell me. <laughs> right. And that's, you know, I think that that's, uh, um, I mean, I actually found out for this particular child as part of his punishment and his birth family, um, he had been like strapped to a chair in yeah. a pickup truck and had to watch all the other kids play outside. Oh I mean, gosh. You know, like, ooh. yeah, but that, how would I have ever known that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I didn't. And I think that that's, that's what to me is so important about our relationships is honoring and respecting these, these children as incredibly yeah. interesting, wonderful humans who are right. trying out how to be a human being in a world that I have a hard time after 70 years figuring out how to be a human being in. Yeah. They're they're so so listen to them. They yeah. they are so wise and they I think we we if we listen to their play, we watch their play, we don't butt in, we don't try mm -hmm. to smoosh them into boxes. Yeah. Uh, 
And yeah, I think my my other frustration with the conversation about resilience and social emotional learning and all of this is again, not that it's not necessary and important, but these the children who are showing us their trauma are seen as disruptions and we want the resilience information so that we can stop the disruption and continue along our way instead of saying, "Oh, maybe we need to be disrupted." Like <laughs> maybe I as a teacher um, need to be disrupted in this way so that I can be what this, this child needs and, and the other children who aren't showing me the need can benefit from that too. Yeah, no, I think I absolutely, I mean, I, I was the first teacher first, uh, the only first grade teacher in my school when they said, we we're going to do inclusion. Um, and they, he asked where principal asked for volunteers. And I was like, it was right, right before IDEA happened. Uh -huh. There was one teacher in every grade level who volunteered and I had for six, um, you know, wow. you know, in first mm -hmm. grade. And, and that's what I found was that it, that it wasn't, it, it was so beneficial for all the kids. Mm -hmm. And but again, I respected all of them, all mm -hmm. of them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they all had things to, to, to learn and to grow from and, and empathy. And, you know, like I never had a bunch of little faces that I, on popsicle sticks that I could hold up and like, who's happy today? Um, because- because we talked about happiness and we talked about sadness and we, we, I let, I encouraged them to communicate with each other from, I, I just fell into a lot of early childhood experiences mm -hmm. that helped me to learn yeah. how to help kids be in relationship, not only with me, but also with each other, which right. is another part of that resilience model that I really think is important to remember is it's not just us. Yeah. It's, it's the other kids that peer right. relationship are also a protective factor mm -hmm. and it's something that we sometimes I mean obviously play is where that is rich right um and so when we're encouraging children to play by themselves and solve their own problems and giving them the tools to do that we're yeah. that's also promoting resilience for all children yeah yeah so then the third thing that you had in that list is stories and that kinds of kind of leads us back to the book specifically um, you use nursery rhyme, no fairy tales. Sorry. I was talking about nursery rhymes a couple of days ago. You use fairy tales <laughs> like in here that. as like yeah, a model for how stories can be used, yeah. um, in this way. So, so talk about that a little bit. Okay. So, um, I've always been fascinated with fairy tales. I actually did my master's, um, thesis on fairy tales and social and emotional development, socio-moral okay. development. Um, and so I had that foundation and, um, truth in <laughs> truth in story mm -hmm. um well, at the same time for me to do my dissertation um i had a i wanted to do it on resilience and i had a they actually they booted back my prospectus and said that, that i needed to work on it and i got irritated because, oh boy <laughs> because I'm, i was like i'm 62 years old and i'm a snot <laughs> <laughs> yeah and let me so, tell you <laughs> let me tell you i know what i'm doing um and I, as I was ranting and thinking about giving up the program, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> we're such kindred spirits. <laughs> I learned. I've already learned what I wanted yeah, to learn. Yeah. How dare you? Um, anyway, <laughs> the mind said, "What are you passionate about? This is going to be a long slog, and um, you, you're going to need to pick something that you're passionate about. And resilience is obviously it, except mm -hmm. for what? Yeah. And um, I was like, "Well, I like fairy tales," and he said, "Well." I mean, could you, could, could you, could you do something on fairy tales? Mm -hmm. And when I started to look at fairy tales and think about fairy tales, I knew that developmentally they really did, uh, they matched children's cognitive and social and emotional development um, that I'd found that out through my previous um, work. Mm -hmm. And I thought, but wait a minute, fairy tales, resilience, they're all about overcoming the dragon or whatever mm -hmm. it is. And that is what resilience is. So I thought, let me let me actually look at fairy tales from all over the world and see if they are have these specific protective factors in them. And in fact, I found that they did. I did a descriptive content analysis and blah blah blah, blah and it turned out my data was really good. Um, and which is, you know, I mean, I could have probably said that without <laughs> doing the study, but it was really fun. Yeah, 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 good. Um, yeah. So I think, um, and the, <laughs> when I, I say that, I think children's play comes from lots of different sources, um, but it comes from stories. 
Mm -hmm. And it comes from often when we see their make-believe play, it comes from the stories that they see on TV. It comes from books that we read. It comes from, you know, like mm -hmm. things that they experience in their houses, wherever it's all, it's all about story. And to me, it's important that we um, share kids with kids stories that really are about resilience, about overcoming obstacles. Mm -hmm. And a lot of um, children's literature um, that, is coming out and it seems like we're really tipping so far yeah. to the, you know, it's like, I am happy. Yeah. <laughs> like, let's find out how to be happy. And uh -huh. like, Jimmy has a problem. Let's solve the problem. And to me, those are not stories. Those are like news reports. Right. right. It's propaganda. <laughs> and I don't, I don't think that, um, that uh, I, I think, again, getting back to the respect that I have for children and for their intelligence uh -huh. and for their ability to to um, see through a lot of BS, um, I think a lot of those those books that we like, and mm -hmm. there's some very popular books that I just am like, yeah. I don't, they're not good stories. Right. And fairy tales and folk tales have been around for hundreds, many of them thousands of years mm -hmm. and have been retold by every culture in the world in, in different ways. And to me, that core, when we talk about, you know, like you and I've talked a little bit about representational schema, story mm -hmm. schema. Yeah. Um, they they repre they are that. They are they are the the pared down, they are a way for kids to understand what a story is and they offer resilience and generic stock characters that kids can identify with on many different levels. Mm -hmm. And so I decided that I would kind of combine it all. And I think, um, and they're also um, hard to find in a lot of early childhood classrooms. Because... Yes. I, that's what I was going to say. I found out, um, uh, you know, a year or a couple years ago in one of my classes that they don't my students didn't know who Mother Goose, what, what I was talking about when I said Mother Goose. And then fairy tales, they knew like the ones that had Disney versions, but otherwise they weren't familiar with like the real story. Um, and, I, you know, I started thinking about classrooms I've been in and unless it was that commercialized, uh, you know, uh, can't think of the publisher. Anyway, story. Um, mm -hmm. uh, they just weren't, they weren't there. But But you kind of address in the book that, there are some folks who think that we should ignore fairy tales because of, you know, what, what they see as problematic messages. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I think, and I think that, and that's, again, that's not new. Mm -hmm. um, I like that, that I started seeing like big backlash about that, even in the seventies and mm -hmm. then eighties, and then it kind yeah. of seeded. And now, yeah. And I mean, I think people think that, I mean, there's, you know, sexism, there's ageism, there is, um, you know, um, consent, you know, mm -hmm. yes, yeah. you know, like all yeah. this stuff. And what my understanding, I mean, those are all, those are all, I mean, you know, you important things to think about. Yeah. Yeah. We don't want to like expose kids to ideas that are going to um, destroy them. But to me, I think one of the problems, and I've thought this for a very long time, with people with adults understanding or objections to fairy tales is that mm -hmm. adults are looking at them through adult eyes. Mm -hmm. Young children do not have the same cognitive frameworks and that we do. Mm -hmm. And so children do not understand folk and fairy tales in the same way that we do. Mm -hmm. They're they believe in magic. They believe in the, you know, they're trying to figure out the good and evil thing. Yeah. And a lot of the more granular concerns that adults have, kids, it just kind of flows right by them. I mean, the violence, you yeah. know, I mean, you know, like kids, if they watch a, a, a violent, you know, if, if Road Runner runs off the edge of the cliff, <laughs> you know, like, it's like, okay, but the next scene, he's back up. Yeah. And they, as they are creating mental images of fairy tales, they have that same kind of, um, Kind of bounce back effect yeah well yeah but they don't they don't they don't fixate on the things that we as adult readers may fixate mm -hmm. on fairy tales they yeah. hear a good story with lots to engage their imaginations yeah. with this message of resilience yeah and i'm glad you included that and i wanted to make sure that i asked you about it because 
I have shared that concern, even though in my own life, I love fairy tales. And, uh, you know, just not too long ago, I um, was on kind of a, a fairy tale book uh, kind of jag. And, you know, I found one, a collection called Tatterhood that I'd never heard of before that was all very strong female characters from all over the world. Yeah, I was like, I know that Stephanie has heard of this one um, <laughs> or has it on the shelf behind her, um, which was cool. But so so I I had already sort of been if if I'm finding power in these stories, why am I thinking that they would be like, why do I need to hide them? From mm -hmm. children? Like I was already kind of there. And so layering in this, this idea that you've presented here that they have a really strong potential for resil for, for contributing to children's resilience was helpful to me. I don't know. I don't okay. know if that was my, my little soapbox ramble, but um uh so so I'm thinking through that I mean I'm still thinking through that but um yeah. and I think I think I mean it's it's like there are thousands and thousands of fairy tales out there from mm -hmm. all over the culture in the world and yeah. there are like horrible ones yes yes <laughs> would not you know I wouldn't share and what we are able to share with young children really is just this tiny cluster mm -hmm. of fairy tales that have been put into um picture books honestly I mean most mm -hmm. most most early um, childhood people that I know don't want to read a book without pictures to yeah. their kids. They don't want to tell the story orally, which is honestly, right. that's where the most powerful storytelling happens yeah. um, because kids can construct mental images and everything. Yeah. You've got the picture books and they are just, uh, they're, they're a fraction of, of what folk and fairy tales are all about. Yeah. Um, I look for the, the picture books that I feel are authentic to the meaning of the story that really have uh, authors who have gone and dug deep uh -huh. and look at, you know, especially like cultural um, stereotypes and things like mm -hmm. that. Sure. That stuff. And, you know, are, you're like, where'd you get this story actually? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And how are they represented? And, and when you take like in, in a book like Tatterhood, which are really kind of pure, um, they're told in that very simple, basic fairy tale language. Yeah. Um, that's what I think kids need the most is so that they can engage in their own imagination and put them their yeah. self like we do when we're when we're reading books. Yeah. And <clears throat> because we know at the age that, you know, this birth to five age, especially, but I would say even, you know, older than that, um, they're still so reliant on the concrete. Um that they are going to connect what you're either reading or telling as a story immediately to their own concrete experience as a human so far. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, I guess what I'm saying is there's so much value to providing those things and making them part of children's lives that we can trust that, that they're not going to go straight to becoming problematic children who are sexist and ageist and, <laughs> and, and, and cruel um, just because we've told this story. You know what I mean? I, I right. and, Again, and I, just sort of processing as I go, but. I mean, I think if you look at, at I mean, who are the bad guys? And I mean, who are the cruel people in fairy yeah. tales? The bad guys. Yeah. They get punished. And yeah. that is very satisfying for a child. It was like, I mean, that's, that's, you know, I mean, uh, there's a lot about Kohlberg that I'm not crazy about, but yeah. I think he really did, he and Gilligan really did hit on um, how young children develop an understanding of, of morality mm -hmm. that, that really runs parallel to, to fairy tales. Yeah. Yeah. There, there, that intentionality and all of those things, very, the birth to five, yeah. not, not part of their, uh, <laughs> not part of the way they're processing. No, no. They want yeah. to know that, that if you do good, you that good stuff happens, and if you do bad, the bad stuff happens yeah. because it's their their concrete understanding of the world. And I think fairy tales do a better job of that than a lot, even a lot of modern children's mm -hmm. books, for sure, which, which tend to to focus on intentionality and and are really much more ambivalent for mm -hmm. young children. Yeah. Um, which is not maybe not bad, but yeah. So so the other thing that is great about the the book is that you've got, you know, like the first half is sort of theoretical, the conversation we're having now. And then you get into individual fairy tales and you talk about how they, not crafts, you know, not like, here's how to put this on your lesson plan, 
but here's how these ideas could be played with um mm-hmm. from the story do you want to i don't know if you want to talk about a specific fairy tale and kind of and give some examples or or how you want to uh, sure. address that part of the book but i think it's important that people know that this is also something that you can yeah plug in. <laughs> as as a a, law, a lifelong teacher i mean you know like the, the- i love theory mm-hmm. <laughs> me too <laughs> I love the research that I like that and passionate yeah. about that. But honestly, I knew that when I decided that I was going to try to turn my dissertation into a book uh-huh. that real people read because yeah. nobody reads dissertations, what I wanted to do was make it something that was practical for teachers. Uh-huh. So teachers could say, okay, here's like um uh, like this this my latest newsletter was um a Black History Month and I I took looked at two different um versions of Little Red Riding Hood, one an African American one and one from Africa called um Pretty Salma. Mm-hmm. And to me, those are like, okay, so you read the stories, kids like them, you read them in group, you read them like individually, whatever mm-hmm. you have in the classroom, kids get interested. So how do you build on that interest? Mm-hmm. Um we know that the more kids more concrete experiences children have, the more they'll play with the ideas, both mm-hmm. the social emotional stuff, the resilient stuff, and whatever intrigues them, you know, yeah. like, um, yeah. in, in their play. And the more they'll start weaving those into their play, and it's through their make-believe and their pretend play that really all of these protective factors for resilience start to, to take root and, and grow, I believe. Mm-hmm. So what do you put in your classroom? What kind of materials can you put in your classroom and your centers to inspire, if they're interested, that kind of play mm-hmm. at your writing or your story center? You know, like if you put down, um, I'm just spitballing here because I yeah. didn't write this at all. Yeah. yeah. Put down, like if you put down like red paper or red crayons and brown crayons um if you use uh, like one thing i put in my newsletters were like a lot of baskets uh-huh. like we all have baskets in our classroom but whip them out and put everything in baskets and just put random baskets around your classroom because that's one of the one of the motifs of the story is doing good with the basket uh-huh selma puts it on her head <laughs> like uh-huh. carries eggs you know uh-huh. whatever um, but ways that putting things in your centers um that will maybe make kids connect with them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe there, if you're going to have some kind of materials out for a, um, a a, a project, if you do some kind of art project, I'm I'm really big on um, like collaborative murals because I can't draw. Yeah. Right. I need others (laughs) in on it with me. (laughs) Let's all come together and make this thing. That's all I don't have to do. This will be my corner. (laughs) I will be the one who gets the glue. <laughs> exactly. <yes. laughs> but but helping kids, you know, create, uh, you know, let's do finger painting and uh, like maybe we can cut those finger paintings that, that you just did into, uh, you know, I'll help cut cut them out into forests and, you uh-huh. know, like what else do we need? And that, those kinds of things yeah. that make connections. And I know I've I've just signed up for your theme class. So oh, I'm, nice. I'm, <laughs> I'm curious about what, yeah. what um, but I think that, as as a as a long time early childhood person, um, I gave my kids plenty of time for, for play, to play whatever they wanted to. Mm-hmm. But there was I also offered things that would help them make those connections. Mm-hmm. Right, the story we were reading was something they were interested in, and so though they're in yeah. the book. There are lots of different ways that you can tie a story in or materials you can offer, including mm-hmm. things. I'm really hit on um, the biggie, the self-regulation, which yeah. I think is um, so significant to all kids. All kids need to develop it. For some kids, just because of their temperament, it's going to be easier than others' mm-hmm. in this environment. But to me, the idea of self-regulation, we've missed the self part. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's not other regulation. Uh-huh. Like, I don't want you to self-regulate because I tell you to, because then it's, Stephanie regulate right. mm-hmm. on self-regulation. <laughs> yes. Well, I offer a lot of <laughs> ideas about, um, and uh, you know, when do kids have the hardest time with self-regulation? It's during transitions. It's mm-hmm. during those kinds of things. So I try to offer things that um, were always helpful for me to do with kids, um, whether it's singing a song related to it or giving mm-hmm. them. And I think the, we, 
young children develop their imagination between birth and five. Like mm -hmm. that's representation comes online. And we tend to forget that that's our the greatest tool in the toolbox is when when kids are engaged, you can engage their imagination. That's when you're engaging the part of their brain that is blossoming. Mm -hmm. And so I offer a lot of, you know, just ideas that I hope will be springboards for teachers, a lot of movement activities, mm -hmm. you, move, you learn regulation through movement, you learn yeah. you know, all of that stuff. Um, and I just tried to put a whole hodgepodge of, of ideas in there for each of, um, I think there's six stories in the book with different variants from different cultures. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought were interesting. My editor kept telling me to slow down on those. Um, she was like, this is not a book on fairy tales. It's on resilience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we need the fairy tales. Oh, yes. fairy tales. Yeah. Um, anyway, I, I just tried to make it something that I would have felt really use, found really useful mm -hmm. as an early um, childhood person. Yeah. Um, and and I it's a it's a model, right? You know, you have some specific things, but it's also a model for that person who's like, well, I don't know how to come up with things that follow children's interests based on the story we read, or I don't even, I wouldn't know where to start or, right. um, so, so it's, it's a good for those folks who are in that like survival stage and need the yes. specific idea. And then also it's a springboard for those who are kind of consolidating their, right. their, experience with new information and, and figuring I, it all out. I think, I mean, a couple of quick things. One yeah. is um, I sent, uh, I, I mean, I taught community college for 20 years and I also was in the field a long time. Uh -huh. So I found people for, at all different points on their uh, career continuum. Mm -hmm. I ask for volunteers to read chapters and give me feedback on the. Oh, on great. The so yeah. a lot of like the whole acknowledgements is a just a ton of my former students ranging from people who are just in the classroom for a year or two uh -huh. to colleagues that have been in for, you know, 20, 30 years yeah. uh, and saying, you know, tell me how to make this better. What this activity part of it, um, yeah. you know, like, too much. Some people said way too much information. The people with less experience were like a little bit more. Oh <laughs> yeah, sure. So I tried to kind of hit a balance with, with that. Um, but the other thing that I haven't really talked about with like the resilience piece is um, I also offer some some ideas about some of the protective factors for resilience that each story, each fairy tale really yeah. like hits on yeah. and examples of things teachers could talk about with kids, how they could get kids at a, if they had the kids telling stories. I'm a big Vivian Paley person. Mm -hmm. um, they, kids were telling and acting out the stories, the kinds of questions they could ask if they felt like this might be useful. And if they got answers that were scary, I actually had oh. um, mental health professionals give me feedback on like, oh, what, that's great. Really childhood person. Would it be okay for me to say, and what should I like mm -hmm. send off to somebody who had much more background in that area? Yeah. Than I did? Yeah, that's great. I'm glad you included that. Um, and, and, I mean, in this conversation, of course, I'm glad you included it in the book, but I'm glad you also brought it into this conversation. So um, it, it's been all, we've got about time to wrap up, um, but I we're, we're going to have to have another conversation soon. Um, so you mentioned a newsletter. Do you want to tell folks what that is and how to find it if they want it? And um, yeah, um, I, um, because, of, because I fear too, too many fairy tales and I am not done with this work. Um, I started last, a, a little over a year ago, uh, or a little under a year ago, I started a newsletter called Imagination on the Move. And every week it's like a couple of fairy tales and one, one or more, um, how it ties into resilience. And then some, a couple of classroom type connections that you could make or, or for parents, things they could do with their kids at home mm -hmm. even. Um, if you anybody wants to subscribe to it, um, you can go to my website, which is just www.imaginationonthemove, one word, dot com. And they you should have a little pop up thing that will say subscribe here. And if you give me your right. email address, I'll put you on the list. Yeah, and... I'll, we'll put the link in the uh, description for the episode, too, for that. And before I forget, if people want to order the book, they order from Redleaf Press. If they use the code HER2024, they can get 10 percent off um through I think the end of April so um hopefully 
hopefully people will, will go find it. I um, hopefully a lot of people already have, cause I've really enjoyed it. And I, you know what, if I'm, if I'm honest, it might not have been something that I would have picked out if I hadn't met you and been convinced that, you know, just, not the only one. <laughs> well, you know, so I'm so glad I'm just, I'm really glad it's out there and, um, and that, uh, and that you're here to talk about it and for Thank more you. folks and, um, um, I don't know any last things you wanted to include that we haven't touched on. I don't, I don't think so. Okay. I mean, I, I, I appreciate you giving me the chance to, to talk with you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. So just thank you for the work. Thank you for this book um, and for the continued work on the newsletter. And, um, and I know people who go out now and, and find you are going to be glad they did. Thank you so much. Yeah. Heather. Thanks everybody for listening to another episode of that early childhood nerd. <laughs>